Well, good to have everybody with us this morning. A welcome, glad that you're here uh, as we continue our study of Second Kings. Just a, a couple things by way of introduction this morning. Uh, just as we uh, get moving and going with uh, our class today. Uh, so we are continuing uh, Second Kings. If you were with us last week, you saw that we picked up with the end of Elisha's life. Elisha was a major prophet uh, near the end of the book of First Kings. And Elisha then takes over um, uh, the start of the book of Second Kings. Um, and there's this transition then the, the, last, the last week we talked about to the prophet from Elijah to Elisha. And so Elisha becomes the prophet and he has and displays the, the power of God uh, and miracles that he performs and signs and wonders that he does uh, amongst the people of Israel. And so uh, we're going to continue uh, following the, uh, the ministry of Elijah here in these next uh, next couple of weeks, uh, we're really looking um, more so at Elisha and his works that God does through him than we are even at Elijah or uh, than we are at any kings that are going on in these next chapters. The, the focal person that we're, we're, we see here is Elisha. So we actually have more um, miracles of Elisha recorded than we do of Elijah, um, but he is the Elijah's successor in the midst of that. So let's go ahead and begin with the word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. I uh, thank you for all that you give to us. I uh, just ask that you would continue to uh, send your spirit in among us so that we can continue to learn and follow you even more closely. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so I have a question on there of what's your favorite occasion to prepare for? That can be a, a big occasion like a holiday or it could just be something smaller um, or uh, just uh, something that maybe you're not even preparing to host or something, but just prepared to do. So whatever that might be for you, I just kind of share that at your table. What's a favorite occasion that you like to prepare for? I'm gonna go ahead and mute us here. It is good to, to be with us today, be with every, all of you today. I've got the... Uh, you got the microphone here when we're reading in the room so that, that we can try to hear a little bit better online. Um, would somebody in the room be willing to start us off uh, reading verses one through eight? Russ, will bring the microphone around to you. Anybody want to start us off? Yeah, Alan, thanks so much. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, we'll get you on the next one, Alan, all right? We'll get you on the next one. Joram, son of Ahab, became king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. King of Judah, and he reigned 12 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father and mother had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal and his father that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Naboth, which he had caused Israel to commit. He did not turn away from them. Now Mesha, king of Moab, raised sheep. And he had to supply the king of Israel with 100,000 lambs, and it was a wolf of 100,000 rams. But after Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So at that time, King Joram set out from Samaria and mobilized all of Israel. He also sent this message to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? I will go with you, he replied. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. By what route shall we attack, he asked. Through the desert of Edom, he answered. All right, thank you so much. So, so as we, uh, we go here, we, we look at, um, we look at um, kind of the lay of the land and what's going on here. So, um, in the ancient world, what happened was if you had a um, if you had a a kingdom, you had an army, and you had to defend it. Um, no one else was going to do that for you. If you were more powerful or more influential or whatever it was than the other kings and peoples around you, you tried to exert your authority. Sometimes that was in friendly relations, and you'd intermarry, and you'd be kind of like equals. Uh, sometimes that was in unequal relationships. And if you had the power and authority, you could say, hey, um, I'm going to come and wipe you guys out unless you pay me tribute every year. 
So you're buying them off, in other words, so that they won't, uh, won't kill you or hurt you. And this is the arrangement that Israel has with Moab. Now, if you remember um, the king before, so it, it talks about here in, in chapter three, um, it talks about um, this Jerom becomes king. Um, he's the son of who? Who are his parents? Ahab and Jezebel, right? It doesn't name her here, but Ahab and Jezebel, those are the parents. Um, the wicked queen Jezebel in the midst of all of that. Uh, the Ahab and Jezebel. Um, and so um, as they, they go through, this is who we're talking about. Ahab was a wicked king. Um, and if we remember what makes a king good or bad, according to the Bible, a good king worships the Lord and encourages the people to do the same. A bad king does it, does the opposite, worships at false idols and encourages the people to do the same. All right. In the whole northern kingdom of Israel, after the divide, after Solomon, how many good kings are there according to that definition? Zero. They never have a king in the northern kingdom of Israel that worships Yahweh and encourages the people to do the same. And as it goes through, it's always Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom. We looked at that in the first book of Kings. Um, he's the one that leads the starts this leads them, and so it's uh, walks in the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, is usually what it often says. Um, so here it compares him to his father. He doesn't uh, listen or follow the um, Yahweh, but not quite as bad. Not quite as bad as his dad and his mom, right? But it doesn't mean he's doing the right things here at all. So. Um, so that's what we, we get uh, here as we start. Um, and so as we look at, um, we look at this, this is what's going on in Israel. So um, what's happened in the kingdom of Israel, uh, Jehoram becomes king when his brother dies. If you remember, we looked at that last week, his brother only lived about a couple of years. He fell and he didn't get better. He inquired of, was going to inquire of the Baals. Um, uh, if he's going to get better. And Elijah's, Elijah's like, no, you're not going to get better. Um, um, he's not as bad as his dad, but he still worships other gods. Moab then rebels and no longer wants to pay tribute. And so if you think about that from Moab's perspective, so Ahab was an awful king according to uh, his religious and moral practices. But he was a phenomenal king when it came to his economics. He married... Um, married Jezebel, which gave him, um, which gave him then the uh, um, access to the Phoenicians. Uh, that's the top left part of our map. That's where she was from. Those are Tyre and Sidon. They had the ships all over the place. And so gave him access there. Uh, he had uh, rebuilt Jericho, which gave him access to uh, kind of the territory down south and the trade routes uh, on the other side of the Jordan River as well. Uh, as well as the controlling uh, Megiddo and the passes um, going through the Jezreel Valley. So he became wealthy that way, very good economic leader. And part of that was subjecting uh, Moab, you know, to making him a vassal state where Moab paid tribute to King Ahab. So all of that was really good for Israel, but Ahab dies. His next son is kind of a weak, short-lived king. And now his next son becomes king and Moab says, Ooh, there's turmoil there. Maybe we can get away with not paying tribute anymore. Maybe we can get out from under the thumb of Israel. And so they stopped sending tribute. Yeah, Rusty? Um, when the first king, he did not uh, worship the Lord. How about the people in that land? Did they worship the Lord? So with Jeroboam, you mean when Israel started? Yeah, so Jeroboam enticed the people to start worshiping other Baals or other gods, including Baal. So he set up temples to Baal, both in the north and the south, and said, these are your gods that have given you this land, that brought you out of Egypt. Worship them. Nobody, nobody went ahead and worshiped the Lord in that country. And so if you remember back when, um, if you were with me at the, before Easter, or before Lent, we were talking about the ministry of Elijah. Um, and Elijah tells the people, when he's battling the prophets on Mount Carmel, he's like, choose who you're going to serve. Is it going to be the Lord or is it going to be Baal? What are you going to choose? Who are you going to serve? So they're waffling back and forth, Rusty. It's going, um, and he wins this great victory. He has the prophets of Baal killed, but nothing changes. The queen wants to kill him even more. He runs away. 
And he says, I, I only need, I'm the only one left. And God says, no, I've reserved at least 7,000 in Israel who have not worshiped Baal. So there's a remnant of faithful followers, but on the most part, people are waffling between, some are devoted Baal followers. Some might worship Yahweh sometimes and Baal sometimes, right? So they're going back and forth. But there is a, a, a small group, at least, a remnant of faithful followers still in Israel, even throughout this period of, of apostasy by these kings. Yeah. So, so this is where, where we're at, the lay of the land. We're going and, and have these things. Uh, Moab. So let me get my pointer out uh, for you guys. Uh, Moab, as you can see, um, if you look on the right side of the map, you see way up the top, you see Aram. Um, so that's way up at the top. That's uh, like modern day uh, Syria. That's where Damascus is, is in Aram. Um, then you, if you go south, you'll come and see the next all capital letters there is Amnon, or Ammon, I should say. Um, those are the Ammonites. Um, and their territory was, was more contained. It, it kind of, where the, the left of, you know, the, where that box, that text box is over here, um, that's kind of where that's at, where that ends. Um, so this is kind of the territory of Amnon here, where that text box goes. They, didn't, they tried to get all the way over to the Jordan River, but that was more really Israelite territory. Uh, the modern day city of Amman, Jordan, you know, that's the, the capital of Amman. Uh, it's spelled the same as, as Ammon, as we have up here, Ammon or Amman. Um, this is their territory. Um, goes all the way back that far. And then you go farther south and you run into Moab down here. Um, really the, uh, uh, the, the northern part of that, I know the, the words are small, um, but really their territory is between the Arnon Canyon and the Zared Canyon down here. And that's where Moab is uh, um, typically between those two canyons is the territory of Moab. And, and this is uh, where they lived, where they operated, uh, how they worked in all of those things. Um, that's their territory. But again, they're not necessarily satisfied with staying put in their territory. They want to expand, especially up here to the north uh, to get into these trade routes and some better farmland. Up here, what's called the, the Medaba Plateau up here. Um, and so that was Israelite controlled land when they could, um, but they rebelled, they pushed farther to the north uh, in the midst of all of that. Um, and so um, this king of Israel, he doesn't want to lose his tribute. He doesn't want to lose that revenue stream coming in from all those sheep and the wool. So he goes and he talks to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. So if you look at the, basically if you kind of, draw a line from the top of the Dead Sea over to the Mediterranean Sea, that area to the, the west of the Dead Sea, all of that is the kingdom of Judah. That's where Jerusalem is. That's where Hebron is. That's where Bethlehem is, all in that area. Everything to the north of that, um, up and as you go a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee, it even went to the east of the Jordan River, um, that's the kingdom of Israel. Um, and so you have the, um, all of the, that area is Israel. And so the king of Israel says to the king of Judah, sometimes they got along, often they didn't. Um, and, but at this time they're getting along, the, the king of Judah is named Jehoshaphat. It's kind of a fun name to say, isn't it? Um, he, uh, he is a good king, which means what? He trusts in God and leads the people of Judah to do the same. Um, and so he had reforms. Uh, we can read about that in the book of Second Chronicles of the things that Jehoshaphat does. Uh, but he is uh, on good terms with the kings of Israel during his reign, including Ahab. If you remember, he goes out to battle with Ahab when Ahab is killed. Um, Jehoshaphat is, is right there with him. Uh, again, good political alliances, but he's also worshiping Yahweh. And so when Moab rebels, the king of Israel asks the king of Judah, hey, will you go with me into battle? Put this king back in his place with me. They go and they also enlist the help of the king of Edom. That's the, the kingdom to the south. 
Now, if uh, if you know anything about the geography or the the climate or the of this area, uh, the farther south and east you get down here, it's very arid. It doesn't rain very often. <laughs> if it rains eight inches a year, they're having a, a banner year for rain. All right, it's it's a desert-like climate, uh, and the peoples in that place throughout the time. Um, have done some amazing things to try to get rain into that those places and spaces. Uh, so that's that's where they're going, um, and they decide to instead of coming this way, crossing front of Jericho and meeting Moab head on, where they're already probably fortified and entrenched, they come down this way. They collect Edom, and they they're they're coming at them the circuitous route from the south uh, to try to um, maybe catch Moab by surprise or come where they're maybe not as um, tactically defensively strong. So that's what's going on there. Any questions on that? I mean, there's a lot of exposition as we got into that. All right. Alan, would you read the next uh, verses for us, nine through 12? So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. After a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water than themselves, for the animals with them. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord to him? And no. an, an officer of the king of Israel answered, Elijah, the son of Shaphat, is here. Be used to pour water in the hands of Elijah. Uh, one, one more verse. Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. All right. Great. So we have, uh, they're going and um, they're going a desert route and they don't take enough water with them. <laughs> So whether it took longer to move all of these people and armies than they thought, uh, but after a week, they're running out of water. And um, the king of Israel, he's like, oh, God's executed his judgment upon us. I don't know why he always gets in the way, right? Not, not oh, I guess we should have brought more water. We planned really poorly. You know, he's... You know, it's all God's fault, right? You know, so they never, he never looked to God when he needed anything, but he just assumes it's God's fault when it's really probably his poor planning uh, in the midst of this that, that uh, has caused them the predicament. Jehoshaphat, though, it says, hey, we're in trouble. Is there a prophet of the Lord we can talk to about this? So Jehoshaphat says, hey, let's go and, and talk to somebody about uh, what God can do for us in here. Um and so what, who do they discover is around? Elisha. Now, whether God had told him to kind of go hang out with the army or, or whatever else, or he's maybe being like a chaplain to the army, who, who knows? But, Jehos but uh, Elisha is with the army. And so they go to Elisha, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, um, and the king of Edom. These three kings go down to the prophet to inquire of them. They probably should have done this first. Seven days earlier, right? And said, hey, which route should we take? I don't know. Is there a prophet here that we can figure out which route we should take? They probably should have done that first. That would have been better planning. Uh, not to mention bringing more water with you. All right. And so they go down and, and talk to them. Um, Elisha notes that he's the... He's the one that poured water on the, the hands of Elijah. He was his servant. He was the son of the prophet Elijah, right? Not in, not uh, genetically, but as we've talked about that term, sons of the prophet, right? He was with Elijah, learning from him, uh, growing in his faith and his understanding of what it meant to be a prophet. All right. Um, and so they go down to Eli Elisha. And then verse 13, Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father, to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha says, as the Lord of hosts lives, 
before whom I stand. Were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him and he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this day, this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink you, your livestock and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give you the Moabites into your hand and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop up all springs of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. The next morning about the time of offering, of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom till the country was filled with water. So uh, Elisha responds, right? First, he's like, um, you know, I wouldn't even see you, Jerome, if it weren't for Jehoshaphat. You're apostate. You, you don't care about the Lord. You just want to blame the Lord for every bad thing. You're just like your mom and your dad. Go to their prophets. Right? And, and, and then he says, well, because Jehoshaphat is with you, he then will prophesy. Because Jehoshaphat is a faithful king, looking to the Lord uh, in, in the midst of those things. And he gets a musician. Uh, this is not the first time a prophet has had a musician around. Um, whether that uh, God, the Lord uses music and however that works, I uh, don't know. But uh, music plays and Elisha begins to prophesy. And there's a kind of a couple parts to this prophecy, prophecy right? First, the, the immediate need, how is that taken care of? God's going to bring water into the dry stream beds. So there's pools of water there. Is that going to come from a natural way from wind and rain? No. God's just going to have water spring forth. He's going to bring water. Is that an easy thing for God? Yeah. This is a small thing for the Lord. He's not even trying, right? You, you messed up. You didn't plan ahead. But this is easy for God. And the second thing, not only will I give you water to drink, but I will deliver Moab into your hand. And not only their army, but every fortified city, every tree, every field, every well, I will give to you. You will destroy them. Right? So God's, God's giving them abundantly beyond, you know, uh, the king of Israel says, God's given us into the hand of Moab. And Elijah <laughs> says, no, I am giving Moab into your hands. Uh, that's what God is doing for you. So um, kind of turns that on its head uh, in this prophecy that's there. All right. So, um, and we see uh, by the time then verse 20, we already see that first part happens, right? Water begins to fill the stream bed. They have water for their animals and for their uh, armies to drink in the midst of this arid desert place. Okay. All right, that happens the next morning. Can somebody um, read for us 21 through 27? Yeah, mom, thank you. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called out and were drawn up at the border. And when they rose early in the morning and the sun shone on the water, the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, this is blood. The kings have surely fought together and struck one another down. Now that Moab to the spoil. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites until they fled before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities, and on every piece of land, every man threw a stone until it was covered. They stopped every spring of water and fell to all the good trees, till only its stones were left in Kir Harvestan. And the slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son, who was to reign in his place, and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. 
And there came great wrath against Israel, and they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. All right, thanks. Um, so how does the battle go? Right, the Moabites get ready for battle. They put their armor on. They know these three kings are coming against them. They look the next morning, and they look to where the camps of Israel are, and they don't know anything about the water, right? It hasn't rained. You know, it has, there hasn't been a storm. They look out, and they see the sun reflecting off the water, and it's red. You know, sometimes we maybe you've seen something like that in the morning on a, a lake or, or something where um, the water reflecting on it the right way makes it look, the sun reflecting on the water the right way, it makes it look red. And they interpret this because they know it can't be water because it hasn't rained and it's arid and dry and there's no water in the stream bed. Wow, the, the, the land is stained red with the blood of our enemies. They must have fought against each other uh, in the middle of the night turned against each other. That was a common thing, right? You'd have different armies, different nations coming together to, to, to do war and their leaders get upset or they get upset and they begin to turn on each other. Moab thinks that these armies have been given to them. They say Moab to the spoil, um, uh, ill-conceived battle cry. Because <laughs> uh, they go to, because they see all the stuff that they brought, if they're all dead and it's theirs for the taking. Um, <laughs> And so they go to take them, but when they get into the camp, they, having left their very defensible positions, are probably now outnumbered and surrounded as they run into the camp, and they themselves are slaughtered. And so um, as they, they go, and then um, Israel and Judah and Edom pursue them, and they do exactly what God had said they were to do. They destroy their fields and cut down their trees and stop their wells and destroy their cities. All right, so it's this, you know, apostasy. It's the, they are, Mo, uh, Moab doesn't believe in the Lord. Uh, they do not follow Yahweh. Um, so God uses these other nations as judgment against them. Um, and then they besiege the city where the king is at. Uh, and so what does the king of Moab try to do to save himself? Well, first he tries to take uh, an entourage of 700 soldiers, probably his elite guard, and they try to burst through the line. Uh, and they do that opposite the king of, of Edom. Maybe he's the least invested of the three kings. Maybe they'll, they'll be the least apt to fight, but it doesn't work. Um, and so um, he then turns to the god of Edom. I'm sorry, the god of Moab, probably uh, maybe Shemosh is uh, one thought that's there, uh, one of these gods that are around them. Um, and he sacrifices his son, burns him up, and hangs him on the wall um, as a burnt offering to his God, uh, trying to uh, entice him and appeal to him to, to save his own life. This is his heir. This is his oldest. This is his hope. And he is trading that in his mind for, for his own life. Um, um, yeah, not willing to sacrifice himself, you know, his, just his son. Uh, and then uh, it's interesting. Um, I don't know what your uh, translations have here in, in verse 27, the end of you know, kind of the middle section of 27. Uh, mine uh, in the ESV says, and there came great wrath against Israel and they withdrew. Um, anybody else has something different there? Fury. The fury, read that sentence there, Alan. Fury against the fury against Israel was great. Anybody else have something different there? Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. <clears throat> great indignation against Israel. Um, and so this is one of those where we're like, well, what does this actually mean? And, and, and sometimes we, we aren't 100% sure. And even after I explain this, I'll say we're still not 100% sure. Um, but uh, one of the things that we look at when we study the Old Testament um, and scholars will look at and they'll, they'll help us understand is they'll look at what's called the Septuagint. Uh, maybe you're familiar or heard that term before. Maybe you never have. Uh, but Septuagint really comes from the, the Greek word for 70. And what happened is um, after Alexander the Great came through in like the, the 300s or so, uh, my, my timeline on Alexander the Great is not great, but he came through um, after, after the time of the Old Testament writings are done. Alexander the Great came through. 
he re um, he um, he conquered pretty much everything the known world at that time the Western world and he made everything Hellenized maybe you've heard of that term before uh, Hellas as a term for like Greek um, and so Greek became the lingua franca it's what everybody spoke and and even after the Romans took over from the Greeks everyone still spoke Greek uh, but he but he really made that it brought the import of their gods other beliefs all over the known world that included Israel and so in Israel you had these uh, people like uh, they came back after the uh, exile in Babylon. We haven't gotten there yet. We will. Uh, that's where Kings ends. Um, but they come back and then they are uh, Persians then conquered by the Greeks. And so now you have um, they speak Hebrew and Aramaic, but now people around them also speak Greek. And, and so they translate the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament into Greek. And the story is that 70 of these elders and scribes translated the Old Testament into Greek, and it's called the Septuagint. Um, it was around when Jesus walked the earth. He would have read the Septuagint and the Hebrew scriptures. But what's interesting is that is anytime you have a translation, there's also interpretation that goes into that. Um, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Hebrew, we get this idiom, this phrase that says, and his nose burned, right? And we might be, what does that mean? Did he have a cold? Did he not have like lo the Kleenex with lotion in it? His nose burned, right? Anybody know what that idiom means? Became, became angry, yeah. He became angry. His nose burned. He became angry or his nose burned against and became angry against. Got red in the face is, is maybe how we would say that, right? What does that mean? Were they, you know, like that's an idiom too, right? And his nose burned. Well, when they translate into Greek or when you translate into English, we don't put his nose burned. We'd say he became angry. And so in the Septuagint, we can see kind of what did they understand this to mean as they were closer to those actual idioms. And it's really helpful for us as translators and as studied students of scripture to understand those idioms from another culture. So we might look at this passage in Hebrew, we're like, well, this is kind of confusing. What does this mean? In the Septuagint, it says that they showed regret is how it's translated. There was, or there was great revulsion. And so when you look at this, um, there was wrath, there was regret. They were grieved that a king would come to this, that he would sacrifice his own son to another god. And then the question is like, well, who are they, who do they have regret with? Is it with the king or is it against Israel or, or who is the regret or the revulsion against? And, and so I'll give you kind of two possibilities here. One is that um, there's this revulsion at what this king did sacrifice in his own son. So they up and leave. Um, or there's regret that he thought it had to, that he thought he could do and cause a false god to, 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 to act this way and gave his son's life up this way. But there's also another possibility. Um, there's also the possibility that uh, either the extreme nature of the siege against this <clears throat> king or Israel's tactics, the, especially the king of Israel, his tactics or his negotiations, that they were so extreme or maybe over the top, maybe outside the Geneva Convention, right? Later thing, that idea that that the Judah and Edom are kind of revolt, uh, this causes them revulsion, and that's why they walk away. So again, the motives, we're not 100% sure, but the end result is the armies disband, they go home because they're so um, appalled at this act. Now, is it what caused the act or the act itself? We're still left wondering a little bit, but that's kind of as we, we walk around and look at this thing. Um, any questions on that? Any any follow up? Any thoughts? Well, you're saying that um, the three armies that came against them, they were so overwhelmed by the Hebrew people that they were so angry that they had to leave the land. So that's what you're saying. So yes, one possibility is they were so, there was such revulsion at what the king of Moab did that they're like, wow, this is what it came to. We want no part of this, even if it's his destruction. The other possibility is 
the tactics that the king of Israel was using in the siege or his negotiation tactics in the midst of that were so over the top that Judah and Edom saw what that cost the king of Moab to do, that they were so um, offended and wrathful against the king of Israel that they're like, we want nothing more to do with this. So those are the two possibilities. Either way, the end result is that they kind of disband and go home. Yeah, Alan? <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, what it, the end result is the same, right? That they don't have total and complete victory here. Yeah. <laughs> well, well it, it's that's the result. Again, whether God planned it or not, we are told that that's the case. Earlier, we're told that they're supposed to destroy everything. And so if that's a switch in plan, we're not told that. Now, could it be that? Yeah, that's one commentator's thought or, or idea that why that might have happened. But we don't know for sure on the why. I guess is what I'm saying. That's a, a third possibility, Alan. Um, and does God know what's going to happen? Absolutely. But does that mean that that's what he wanted them to do? We're, we're not told for sure. Andy? Yes. There's a there's a third possibility. I was re it was in it's in that, uh, <laughs> that book that I sometimes have that atlas that I carry. Yeah. And it says that the the rabbinic exegetes actually have interpreted it not as the king of Moab who killed his son, but it's the king of Edom. Oh, that it so infuriated the Israelites that the fury was theirs that the king of Edom would do such a thing, so they just abandoned the battle. Okay. Now, I, I think that's highly unlikely, but that is, that's the way that uh, a lot of Jews interpret that. I don't know if you could all hear Tom, but he said there's a rabbinic tradition that offers even another option, um, and that the king of Edom, who is the last one mentioned, right, he took his oldest son. Um, um, don't know if that, and Tom's saying that's not necessarily likely, but it does offer another possibility in the midst of that. The king of Edom offers his son, it causes them revulsion, right? I'm going to offer my son so that we can have victory here over the, them, right? So, Anyway, when you get together, I think kind of the point is when you're going against folks that don't believe, that are struggling, and, and Israel's, like Alan, like you said, Israel doesn't believe, and, and the, that's the note pointed out, they're not following Yahweh, and this only Jehoshaphat is. I, your motives, your actions um, may not always come out the way you want them to. Um, because of what's going on there. Um, so there's a there's a note in the in the Lutheran um, the Lutheran Study Bible uh, that that talks about this section, and it says um, um, when it talks about this campaign, how it's ill conceived. They're not prepared. They don't have enough water. They don't really do a good thing. They say today, and I thought this was a kind of a good note. It says today, do not equate poor planning with faith. Right? Did God deliver these kings, gave them water and victory? Yeah. Does that mean they had faith to start off with and go through that? No, they were planning is what they had um, in the midst of that. So, um, so the idea is don't equate that poor planning with faith. Just like, oh, we're just gonna go ahead and show up. Like, God will bail us out, it's okay. Um, that's not faith, that's poor planning. Um, doesn't mean God won't bail you out, but it doesn't. But it's not um, being prudent and wise as God calls us to be with the resources and the gifts and the things He gives. Uh, don't equate poor planning with faith. Um, so I, I kind of like that phrase as we looked at this. Um, yeah, Joseph had, had faith, but but don't that doesn't mean that he had faith going into this or that Israel did because they they obviously didn't in the midst of that as they started. Okay. So let's keep going on. 
So again, we see Elisha as the prophet here bringing God's word, uh, prophesying, which means, you know, sometimes it's preaching, but sometimes it's sharing what's going to happen beforehand, encouraging or dictating what's going to happen. We see that there. Sometimes the prophets uh, worked miraculous signs, and that's what we get in this next chapter. We get uh, Elisha who works uh, miraculous signs here. So uh, can somebody read for us uh, chapter four? Uh, Elaine, you got that? One, one through seven. And Russ, you'll bring me the microphone. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of wine. Then he said, go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all of your neighbors. Empty vessels do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your sons live on the rest. All right, so kind of an awesome account here. So we have this term, son of the prophets, again. Remember, that means that um, this man was a prophet. Uh, he had gone to prophet school, right? That's kind of what that term, son of the prophets, means. Um, and so um, he was a prophet. He was a, a follower of Yahweh, it seems. He was known to Elisha. Um, Elisha is the, the chief prophet here at this time. Um, and she says, hey, uh, my husband is dead. And we have racked up uh, a lot of debt. He racked up a lot of debt as a family. The creditors are coming to, to collect on that debt since he died. We have no resources to pay it off. Uh, and so, you know, Elisha, you know what's going to happen. Um, my sons and I will be um, become slaves. Now, when I when we think of that, we're not talking about slavery like ownership, like property. We're we're thinking about that in terms of indentured servitude. Um, we think about that um, that that's not something that should go on anymore. It's still not a legal thing in the United States. But you think about human trafficking. Some of those folks that get involved with human trafficking. Uh, they want to get to the United States. Okay, but you're going to have to serve and do whatever I say once you get there. Um, that happened in our country um, in, 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 in a way that was more positive uh, many years ago where people would come over from Europe or other places and somebody would be their sponsor. They would pay for their passage and then they would work that off. Um, and sometimes, so uh, we we'll bring your family over and then you work that off for them. Uh, that's what this is like. It's an economic Slavery, working off a debt, an indentured servitude. Still not very great. I'm still not, uh, you know, a, it's, it's not a position that offers hope for her or her kids. They are subject to the will of the, whoever the creditors are. Um, and, and so Elisha intervenes and he says, gather all the, the empty vessels you can find. Whatever can hold something, gather that into your house. And she does. And he says, not a few. So get a lot. Go to your friends and neighbors, get that too. And then begins maybe as a small jar, small jar of oil and begins to fill those things up with oil. And she says, all right, bring me another container. Bring me another container. Bring me another container. And finally, her son's like, that's all of them. And then um, Elisha says, okay, go sell. Pay off the debts. And then you guys can live off the rest. Right, so this is no small amount of oil. Uh, last night when we were talking about this in Bible study, somebody re remembered those, uh, um, when Jesus turned water into wine, those jars of purification. 
and, and maybe they thought, well, maybe there were some of those around that held gallons and gallons and gallons that she filled up. You know, just the, this is probably a small fortune that she's just acquired in oil, right? Um, if, if, it, if that's kind of anywhere close to, to maybe what happened. Um, but it's enough to pay off their debts and enough for them that seems to live on comfortable at least the rest of her life uh, in the midst of that. Um, so just kind of uh, just a phenomenal miracle that uh, God works through Elisha uh, to protect and provide for this faithful family uh, in the midst of this time. All right, any questions or, or comments on that? All right, um, let's keep going. Um, now we're going to go into verse 8 through 17. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived, who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rested there, and he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunammite. When he had called her, he stood, she stood before him, and he said to, and he said to him, uh, Say to her now, say now to her, what? See, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is, is old. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord, a man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. All right, so um, what does the woman do for Elisha? She makes a bedroom for him. She feeds him every time. She says, anytime you're passing by, stop by here and, and, uh, and do that. So shoot him on your map if you find the Sea of Galilee and go down to the south and to the west. Um, there is Shunem, um, just north of Jezreel. Um, it's in the, the crossroads between the Jezreel Valley and the Herod Valley. It's a great east-west trade route if you're going from Phoenicia uh, to anywhere else, uh, up to the Sea of Galilee, up beyond to Damascus. You're passing by this area. So as, as Elisha would go back and forth throughout Israel, is he passing by this way probably a lot? Yeah. And so she says, hey, anytime you pass by, come eat with us. And so he does. And she's uh, convinced of his uh, character and his calling as a prophet. And she convinces her husband to build him a guest room uh, on, the, on their house. And so he does. And he wants to repay the kindness. Uh, and through his servant, he kind of inquires what's going on and finds out that, and sees like, oh, her husband's old. He's going to take care of her. She has no son that would have taken care of her when he died. And, and he says, um, through the word of the Lord, this time next year, you're going to have a son. We've heard those kind of things before, right? Yeah, Abraham and Sarah with the, the messengers. Eli to Hannah, Samuel's mom, right? May God grant your request in the midst of those things. This woman says, no, no, I, I don't, I'm not asking for this. You know, I'm not looking for this. It's okay. I'm doing this, you know. But Elisha says, no, or Elisha says, no, this time next year, you'll have a son. So um, just as we uh, just kind of show you, this is, um, so on, the, on your map, you have the two, two dots there, Jezreel and Shunem. Um, Shunem is on the, the, the hill or the mountain um, of Moray. And so as we look at this, uh, this is Mount Moray. So kind of a, a hill, kind of in the middle. This is uh, the Herod Valley. Over to the left is the, the Jezreel Valley. Herod goes a little farther that way. You can see the flat valley that's there. Uh, in her day, there'd have been more swampland probably in there. Uh, today, it's been drained as, as great farmland. But you can see the, the flatness of the land here. Um, and I'm standing on uh, Mount Gilboa where Jezreel is, is where I'm taking this picture at. So. Uh, you can see the flatness. This is the greenest it is. It's near the end of the rainy season. So if you'd go there um, 
right now this is what it looks like but if you would go like three or four months from now would it all be this brown right um but this is in, in the northern part near galilee um you can see off in the distance kind of a, a village or a city that's over there on the mountain today. That's probably near where Shunem was at back in uh, Elisha's day um, as you go through these things. This kind of give you context of what's there. You can see the, the land where he'd been able to pass through. And so, you know, the, why it was a good road, <laughs> you know, it's not a lot of hills. It's kind of nice, right? I've talked in here before, people are lazy. We're gonna take the easiest route possible. And so that's gonna develop uh, here in this route over time. It's a great uh, trade route in that day. Is that a man-made Yeah. Yeah, so that's a man-made lake. Uh, probably, um, I can't see clearly very uh, there, probably um, aquaculture is going on there. They're probably, they did that a lot in Israel, especially in these lakes that they've made where um, they're fish farming there. So aquaculture is what that's called. So uh, um, they're probably raising tilapia or something in there for them to eat. So can't tell for sure on that. I'm just with the, the picture, but uh, yep. So the this was um, when Israel took possession of this land back in the 40s. Um, the the Jezreel Valley, Herod Valley, is a lot of that would have been swamp land. And so they drained it and um, made made farms into it. So um, you think of like Florida, right? A lot of that was swampland, but now there's, you know, condos and amusement parks and everything everywhere, right? Same same kind of technology. Yeah. All right. Um, let's keep going on. Um, can somebody read for us 18 through 31? All right. Thanks, Sylvia. And one day he went to his father, who was with the others. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap and, uh, until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. She called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly in return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or set or the Sabbath. It's all right, she said. She sat on the donkey and said to her servant, lead on, don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, Gehazi, look, there is the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gaisa came over to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? Elijah said to Gaisa, tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Days I went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So, so, so Gehazi went back to meet Elijah and told him, the boy has not awakened. All right, thank you. So as we, as we look here, uh, what happens to the son? He dies. Um, and the woman hurries and finds Elijah. Um, she gets on, a, on, a, you know, on an animal so she can go faster. Um, and when um, she kind of says to her husband, oh, everything's all right, everything's fine. And, and kind of hurries off um, 
because he's like, it's not a festival day. It's not a religious holiday. What's going on? No, it's all right. But she hurries off, finds Elijah. Um, when Elijah finds out, because um, God has not revealed to him what's going on, he sends Gehazi, his servant, ahead with his staff to, to lay it on the boy. And they begin to go back towards Shunem. Um, and um, Gehazi returns and says, the boy still hasn't wake. That, the, that didn't do it, Elijah. The boy still hasn't uh, waking up, uh, woken up. So just as we look here, uh, we're looking at um, Shunem and Mount Carmel. So going across the Jezreel Valley. Um, so this is, uh, so this is um, from Nazareth, which is on the northern part of the Jezreel Valley. I I'm looking back. This is the other side of that hill of Moray. Um, this is from Megiddo. So um, way over here to the right, um, right over here, right over there is the hill of Moray. And then you go, oh, no, that's Gilboa. That's, so Jezreel is over here where I was looking at. This is the hill of Moray. This is Mount Tabor. So this is the Jezreel Valley today, very green, lush. This was been more swamp-like in their day. They were passed through that roads through there um, as we go. Um, and so she would have gotten on her animal and she's cutting over to, over to the left, which would have been to the west. So I'm gonna just pan the picture so you can kind of see what that looks like. Um, oop, wrong way. So this is that little mountain. So she's coming, uh, shooting over here. This is the Nazareth Ridge that's up here. So she's going farther this way and I'll pan one more time. Um, this is Nazareth Ridge and this is Mount Carmel over here. And so she's going, this is uh, 10 to 15 to 20 miles um, that she's going. I don't know exactly, I didn't map that out. Um, but from the Sea of Galilee to the Mediterranean Sea is about 30 miles. So you're, you're looking at probably 15 miles that she's going uh, on an animal. So she's going quicker than you could walk or run, uh, but the, the animal is galloping as she's going. Don't slow down for me, urge, keep urging the animal on, All right? She, this is urgent. And then she and Elijah come back. Uh, and so this is, this is all of a day, right? I mean, this is, well, you know, yeah, all of a day with the distress and everything else that's going on in the midst of that. You know what that thing may live in there? Um, so a lot of this, um, so anytime you see like white things here, those are homes, but the, the Jezreel Valley, like I said, was swampland. So there wasn't like years of people living there. And that's a really a, a huge agricultural center. So just like you drive through Southern Illinois, you're like, it doesn't look like anybody's living here. <laughs> well, they are, but they're mostly farming. Right. And so, but, uh, as you go, like, um, this is Nazareth Ridge up here. Um, so you go up to the top of the ridge and then it's just jam packed with houses all throughout there. Um, you know, like here, way off in the distance, I mean, you're talking miles away, you can see the white, those are all homes. That's a city or a village that's over there uh, in the midst of that. Um, here you can see, you know, agricultural stuff that's going on. You know, towns and villages uh, all throughout there. Uh, but they're going to do their agricultural work. Just like if you're driving through Southern Noah, there's collections of towns and villages and cities. And then in between is where they're farming. Yeah. So, all right, so let's keep going. Verse 32, when Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. And so he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon the child. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. So, so Elijah had raised uh, the son of the, the Zarephite, Zarephath, uh, the widow from Zarephath who lived uh, up in Tyre and Sidon um, and had done something similar. 
again, why stretching out? Why the, you know, is it giving life? Why walking around? Why the sneezing? There's, there's different commentators that have kind of said different things. Um, but uh, that more describing what happened in the midst of that. Uh, as there. But uh, Elijah heals him, right? He spreads himself on the boy and the life returns to him. Um, that in the midst of these things. All right. Now here, here's something that's kind of cool. All right. Anybody remember, uh, this is the, the mountain of the hill, um, looking kind of more from um, Nazareth, um, that uh, Zarephath is on. Anybody remember what the name of that was? I said it earlier. You're not all into maps and geography like me. <laughs> this is Mount Moray. Moray. All right. So you got a few, you got a few mountains in, in Israel here in, in the Jezreel Valley. Um, so that's Mount Moray as well. Um, so you, you have these mountains that are here. So over here is the Gilboa, right? And it goes up. It's a little far, hard to see. That's where Jezreel is at. That's where King Saul died was on Mount Gilboa. You have Mount Moray that's over here. It's a little foggy. You have this little circle mountain. Uh, it's like a hill sh and a mountain should look like. It just looks perfect. I'll show you another picture here. Um, you can kind of see it popping up again over here, just a little nice circle dome. That's Mount Tabor. All right. And then you have, and then you have Nazareth Ridge over here. Um, so this going back, this is Mount Moray. All right. And so as you're walking around, if you're in the Jezreel Valley, if you go around Israel, you kind of like those are your landmarks in that part of the world. Right. Um, people like if you go out and you're in Colorado Springs, you're like, oh, that's Pikes Peak. Right. You know, Pikes Peak is way more magnificent than anything they have here. Right. But you, we do the same thing. We know the landmarks that are around us. So this is Mount Moray. And this is uh, on, over here on the far side of the hill, on the far side of this hill. Um, that's where Zarephath would have been. You know, like, Pastor Becker, why are you going that into this? Right. Um, Jesus raised a boy from the dead, right? Do you guys remember that story? Remember that account? Anybody remember the name of that? Name. That's where Nain is. A, a village on the same mountain. Do you think the people in Nain were, were acutely aware of Elisha raising this son? Yeah, that, that's in our area. We've got cousins that live over there. My great, 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 great grandfather was that guy's son, right? You know, like they would have known about this, this about Elisha and the raising of the dead. So when Jesus raises this son's widow, or this widow's son, excuse me, um, from the dead, are they going to link the two things? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I lost you guys. There, we're back. All right. Um, but it's the same, it's the same mountain um, that um, where Jesus raises the widow's son. Are they making that connection? Yeah, absolutely. Ha maybe you've never made that connection before. Um, but that's, that's what uh, is going on in the midst of that. So, all right.
to that. Sorry, I'm muted, guys. Sorry about that. Online. Um, yeah, so it's the same geography, same location. Uh, they, they would absolutely make the connection that Jesus is the, um, a prophet of old, like Elisha and Elijah of old, who raised people from the dead. The same location, same place, same action. Yeah, Mom? Do you have any idea why Elijah said that the prophecy was fake? Yeah, um, no. Why, why Gehazi went ahead with the staff only to fail? Um, don't know. Um, yeah, we, we find out about Gehazi a little bit later, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for next week. Yeah, Dad? It could be just another eyewitness that the boy was really dead. Yeah, could be an eye, another eyewitness that the boy is dead. Why to have put the staff on his face or any of those kind of things? Don't know that for sure. Yeah. But yeah, he serves that purpose of, yeah, this is not just the boy sleeping. This is not just the boy like in a coma. He's dead, right? In the midst of that. Yeah. All right. Um, sorry about the technical issues. Those that are with us online. Um, we're, as we get back, um, um, yeah, as we were, we're looking at this, just the, I don't know when you guys cut out or how you did that, but as we look at this, just the, by review, um, this is Mount Moray, and um, Zarephath would be on the far side of this mountain. Nain would be on this near side. Uh, this is the north facing side of the mountain. Um, and this is where, so um, Elisha raised, raises the Shunammite son. Um, Jesus raises the, the widow's son from the dead. So on the same mountain, the act, no wonder people knew and identified Jesus as a great prophet. Uh, in the midst of those things. All right, let's finish up the chapter. Can somebody read for us uh, 38 to the end of the chapter? Thanks, John. And Elisha came again to Gilgal when there was a famine in the land and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. He said to his servant, Set up the large pot of oil scoop for the sons of the prophets. One of them went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and cut them up into the pot of stew, not knowing what they were, and they poured out some for the men to eat. But while they were eating of the stew, they cried out, O men of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. He said, then bring flour. And he threw it into the pot and said, pour some out for the men and they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in the sack. And Elisha said, give to the men that they may eat. But a servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men and they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, so we have a famine in the land. Again, this is, uh, they live on the edge of, um, of sustenance kind of the whole time uh, that there's bad, bad year, there's famine, you know, there's, there's not a lot of food. And so they're, uh, they're trying to make stew for the prophets to take care of them. And so this one man goes out and he finds some gourds or some, you know, some fruit of a vine. Hey, I don't know what exactly this is, but it looks edible. Let's go ahead and try it. And he makes the stew and um, whatever, you know, it's not instant death, it looks like, or when they're eating it, they, they see somebody and somebody knew it wasn't harmful, it was harmful or not good, or maybe they're starting to get sick from it. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not, um, um, I, I'm into geography, horticulture, not so much. Um, but uh, one of the things they think this might be is a, a plant that maybe had some medicinal purposes, but if you ate too much of it, it could cause illness or death. Um, and so as, as what some scholars think that might be um, in the midst of, of uh, this piece here. 
And so Elisha, he throws flour in the pot. And, and so, oh, some people are like, oh, the flour just diluted it all and made it all okay. And though there's a, there's a miracle going on here. Flour is a symbol for life, but Eli Elisha is using that to miraculously be what God works through to bring life. Right? We see this all the time. God using regular things, common things to bring life. In water, he brings us forgiveness of sins and makes us part of his family when his word is combined with baptism. In Holy Communion, God takes bread and wine. And through his word, he makes it something that brings forgiveness and life and salvation. Here, through the word of the prophet, flower in a pot where death was now brings life. Right? God works through normal, everyday things through the power of his word to make them do greater things. This shouldn't surprise us. We should see that. Uh, and, and kind of like, oh, yeah, we get that. We, we see how God works that way. Um, and, and so, um, but there's a second instance now of, uh, of a miracle in this passage. Um, they bring some loaves of bread and they, you know, Elijah's like, Elisha's like, set it before the men so they can eat. And the servant's like, there's only 20 small loaves here. Where are they going to go amongst 100 people? That's laughable. There's no way that that's going to feed them. That would be insulting to them and to you if I served this to them. And he says, no, just set it before them, let them eat. And miraculously, there's enough for everybody to eat and there's some left over, All right? That, that one probably should sound familiar to us, right? Yeah, um, now it's, it's 100, not 5,000, but the reaction of the servant is very similar to that of the disciples, isn't it? There's only five small loaves and two fish, but where are they going to go against so many? Just set that before them, let's eat. And through the word of God, there's miraculously enough left over. Um, we see that happening here um, as well. So uh, two miracles that uh, purifies the death of stool and multiplies loaves for, for the people to eat. What do these sh signs show? What do they show about Elisha? God is with him. He's the prophet of God. He's a man of God. He is God's representative. He's God's man. What do they show about God? That he can do anything? Is God's word still active in Israel? Is God still present for them? He, he's everywhere. He has not abandoned his people, even though so many of them have abandoned God. He's not abandoned even the northern apostate kingdom of Israel. Yeah. According to the word of the Lord, the Lord said, he, he's clear, he's giving credit to God alone in the midst of that. He's just his servant, his messenger, his prophet. Yeah. Um, who performs similar signs? We already talked about it some, didn't we? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Jesus with the, the widow's son at Nain, same mountain as Shun Shunem. Uh, multiplying loaves. Um, somebody last night even talked about uh, and made the connection between kind of the oil and the wedding uh, at Canaan or Cana in Galilee, right? In the midst of that, there was some similarities where God uh, multiplies or he brings something or changes something um, in the vessels and, and some of those things that are there. Jesus performed similar signs. So how did God provide for Eli through Elisha? He provided life. Um, he provided food, water, deliverance, right? Think about the, the, uh, son, of the prophet, son of the prophet's uh, family. Um, he provided freedom and through all that, um, God planned ahead, right? He prepared. I had you talk about what your favorite thing to prepare for is or at the beginning. God was prepared. He planned ahead to have Elisha at the right place at the right time, even though others around them, those kings had poor planning, and they would have died. Elisha is there. God prepared him and raised him up for these moments uh, in the midst of that. None of this caught God by surprise. There's the same miracles go up like today when people get raised from the dead, that it's still possible that God. So, can God work miracles today? Absolutely. Um, at, he can. I'm, I'm not going to limit God uh, in the midst of that. The, the same God who is the God of Elijah and Elisha and who is uh, God in the flesh and Jesus is still active and at work today. 
Now, does that mean he has to do it that way today? No. But does God still work? Are there healing miracles and things that still happen today? Yeah. Um, so um, do we have to have those things happen today for us to have faith? No. Right. But uh, um, we should be very careful about saying, well, God can or can't work this way at this point in time or in this place in history. So, so he, may, he may choose to work this way, but he may not choose to work this way. But we should not be the ones that say God can or can't do that at a certain time or a certain place. Yeah. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and do people try to, to lie and deceive by his name or others today? Yeah, they sure do. Um, but um, we need to be discerning. We need to look through all of those things. But... Uh, but we should not be quick to limit God and what he can do and where he can do it. Um, um, so how does God, so God provided through Elisha. Uh, we should make the connection, the, the draw those lines to and from Elisha to Jesus, just like the people in Jesus day did. Um, so how does God provide through Jesus? Does he provide life? Yeah. Does he provide food? Yeah. We talk about the we already talked about the Lord's Supper, right? He provides us heavenly food to eat. Uh, he provides freedom and life through water and deliverance through that, um, through through forgiveness of sins. God provides these same things, but even now in a greater way, an eternal way, through Jesus. Um, so um, he planned ahead to have Jesus at the right place at the right time. Otherwise, we would have died forever. Yeah, I've never thought of this before, but how they had the food left over yeah. as he provides for us. He gives us extra. Yeah, so they had the food left over. As he provides for us, he provides an abundance. It's more than enough for what we need. It's an abundance to, to share and to, to spread. We, As he fills us, uh, his source never runs out, right? You think about that oil that was poured in, right? It filled every vessel in that house. There was a more than enough. Does God continue to pour into us his spirit and his life? Is his, is his supply more than enough? Yeah, it's only limited by our own capacity, I think, sometimes. Um, but he provides an overflowing amount to you and to me. Yeah, any, any other thoughts, uh, questions, comments uh, as we kind of close today? All right. Well, let me close us with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for providing for us through Jesus Christ. Uh, you are faithful, um, even in, as we live in a world that is increasingly unfaithful. Uh, you still are faithful. You still come to us. You still provide for us life and blessings uh, through your son. Help us, Lord, to, to look for these and see your action in our lives, how you provide. Uh, and help us to, with the abundance you give, to share with others. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great rest of your day.